All right. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, thanks for having me. Um, uh, on behalf of my family, we, again, just um, thank you for, for allowing us to come share. Um, quick couple things before we get started. One is I do not have a lot of time here today. It sounds like I only got about a half an hour. So I got way more slides than, than time, probably. So we're going we're gonna to move right through them pretty quick. Um, and I'm going to try to allow some time at the end for questions. I'd rather talk or answer questions, you know, rather than bore you with, with a bunch of slides. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our family. Um, my sons uh, will be the uh, fifth generation on our operation. Um, so my great-grandfather homesteaded in 1909, just, just north of winter, a little town called Ideal, South Dakota. There's a picture of us. It's my great-grandfather, my grandpa, and then on top there, it's the, the, the current four owners. Uh, most of you probably know uh, my uncle Brian and his son Nicholas, and then it's my dad and my dad Greg, and then myself. And then the bottom picture there would be me with my two sons. Uh, it's a little bit of an old picture. Uh, William there to my left is, is taller than me already. So um, we have 12,000 acres of native prairie, and this is no news to any of you uh, that are in this group today, but this really is our school, the native prairie lands. My Uncle Brian talks about this all the time. He loves to go out to the native prairie pastures with his spade and dig up soil and learn, right? And uh, so we, we really do um, not only use this for grazing, but also uh, we learn about it and try to get our farm, farm acres back to its most native state. We run about 1,000 mama cows on that native prairie, and then we will also graze those cattle uh, in the fall um, on, some, on some crop ground. Uh, we do have an 8,000 head CAFO feed yard, uh, all basically designed for the black Angus bull, which is our widget. Um, everything that we have in our, our yard will be bulls that will be eligible to be marketed throughout the course of the year. Um, this, this past year, 2023, we'll, we'll end up marketing about 6,250 bulls uh, in one fashion or another. Crop acres, this is really my Uncle Brian's uh, area, about 12,000, all 100% no-till for sure, and I'm not going to go through the different. He's got a very, very uh, diverse uh, rotation. Um, and for those of you, I'm sure some of you, maybe a lot of you have heard him speak um, about uh, his crop rotation and his soil, uh, his soil awareness. The third thing of our operation is our hunting lodge on the Lazy J Grand Lodge. We're blessed to be in an area that uh, has a lot of wild pheasants. Um, we're in a very high selenium area. Um, in fact, when we do liver biopsies on our cows, our cows are, are they run in the toxicity level of selenium. And so um, I think that's why we have such good bird hunting, is because the birds like this, the high selenium area. Uh, we'll host uh, about 500 different hunters throughout the course of the year, and we end up harvesting around 6,000 birds. So uh, it's, it's a pretty good part of our business. So this is kind of what I wanted to talk about today. Um, when our family looks at an acre of ground, I love this picture, by the way. Brian took this. See the... the the uh, roots that he dug up. We have the hunters. This is, this is something that we do with our hunters. We, we force them to go on a farm tour, <laughs> OK? It's something that used to be kind of an option. Well, now it's mandatory, because just like we talked about earlier, uh, most of these guys that come through our lodge are about three generations removed from production agriculture. So we make them go on a farm tour. So I just love this picture, because Brian took the picture of that, that root. You see the hunters in the background. And then you see those cows there grazing cover crop. So when our family looks at an acre of ground, and it kind of, uh, it kind of depicts our, our um, logo up here too. So we, we want to we farm that, that, that acre with soil health in mind, right? We want to farm it and try to get that soil back to its most native state. So whenever we're farming an acre, we want to we farm it with, with the awareness of, of the soil. We want to be able to take that same acre and at some point in time put a hoof on it, okay? And whether that's fall grazing or, or summer, you know, full season cover crop grazing, some, at some point in time, it's Brian's goal to have us put a hoof on his farm acre, right? And then the third thing, and I don't think this is even a word, <laughs> agritainment, but I like to use it. We like to be able to take that same acre of property and do some sort of entertainment. In our, in our world, it's, it's pheasant hunting. Okay, and so, so when we talk about an acre or look at an acre of ground, 
you know, we like to have all three of these things in our mind. And that is, that is kind of what our logo de depicts there, right? We want to be able to farm it properly. We want to be able to graze that acre at some point in time. And then we want to be able to do some sort of egg retainment on that acre, okay? So that's, that's kind of what, what, we're, what we're all about when we look at an acre. I stole this from my Uncle Brian. Um, the soil, we're, we're, follow, we're following Mother Nature's lead, right? The soil eats first, the soil then feeds the plant. It's really simple. The plant feeds the cattle. I should put in there then the cattle feed us, right? But then the cattle actually feed the soil back through manure. That is beautiful, right? That's one of the most beautiful things that I can talk about. You guys all know this. Um, but that, that is exactly the way we try to manage our entire operation. The soil does come first, no question about it. These are just some numbers. I'm going to try to get, get through this really quick. For those of you that um, have livestock and, and graze livestock on a crop, cropping, um, the integrated grazing slash cropping, uh, it does work. Cycles residue uh, definitely lowers feed costs. Um, it, it factors in over, overall you know, soil health. Um, it improves that, obviously. Um, and, it's, and it builds organic matter. It's also good for the cattle. Cattle are, are bred to be grazers, right? They're bred to be grazers. So uh, we like to integrate, just like I said before, we like to integrate cattle on the cropping systems. Brian loves it. He used to didn't, he used to, you know, shy away from it, but, but now he's recognized um, that there's huge benefits. This is just an a organic um, a chart that shows organic matter. Um, you can see, um, this is some old data, but we tested about 3,800 acres of graze land and 5,000 acres of non-graze. And when he does his organic matter test, um, you, you can see the difference. It's, it's no news to you guys that when we graze farm acres, it increases organic matter, right? This is another chart. Um, how It just kind of shows that, it's, that it, it, it increases it. We've been working on it, the, the green, the green line is without graze, and, the, and this line is with graze cattle. So it, it just kind of helps uh, expedite the organic matter levels. Grazing increases organic, organic matter. That's not new to you guys. Uh, this is a test that we had, just some economics to it. We grazed about 800 bulls from uh, October to March, a total of 110,000 grazing days, and we grazed about 2,800 acres, and the results this is, this is what's just astonishing to me. In our lot, it costs about $2.83 per head per day to, to feed that bull. When we have them out grazing, 74 cents. Net savings, two bucks. This is real money, you guys, right? And it's there and it actually benefits the soil. And so um, it's, it's, it's huge, big time for us. Um, the health benefits. So we're grazing bulls. So the bulls that, that, that we have out that are in this test, they're actually 24-month-old bulls are coming two-year-olds. They've been out on one lease as a yearling. They come back in. All their testing is done. So really what they need to do is just kind of stay alive till the next spring for the next season. Um, and so they do not necessarily need to be in, in a lot. Great. Um, and so, so this is just some, some semen test results. And you can see this is cover crop grazing. The result, we ended up having 88% pass rate versus 84. 4% 4 more passed their semen fertility test than the bulls that were actually in the lot. So there, there's proof there that it's actually better for the animal to graze as well, okay? They wanted me to talk a little bit about manure management. We like manure, and by default, because of our CAFO, we have manure. Um, but we, just so everyone knows, we'd much rather have the animal spread its own manure. Really works a lot better. This is, this is uh, you know, usually where we spread the manure. It's where we take residue off for like bedding when we, when we bale up the wheat straw or we're taking a lot of residue just because we need that stuff to, to make it through the winter in the, in the, in the feed yard. So incidentally, 8,000 bulls basically that we have in our feed yard, that's 16,000 testicles, right? So we have to make sure we protect those testicles in the wintertime. So we do need to take, my Uncle Brian hates it when we take residue off our crop ground, hates it, but it's a necessity. And so wherever we do take off 
uh, residue, we make sure we go back on with manure. That's, that's kind of how we look at it. Some of the pros, manure is a wonderful crop. You know, soil nutrient, it increases organic matter. Um, you know, it, it does all kinds of good things. Right, you know, it, lots of good nutrients that go back in. Um, where, wherever we spread manure, um, we only go back in with like 30 units of nitrogen, right? Um, those are some of the pros. Some of the cons, spreading manure is not free, right? You guys that have done this before, it's extremely expensive. Um, the equipment is, is hard. The other thing that's hard, it's, it's hard to get a really true test, you know, on the nutrient value of manure. Sometimes you get a lot more dirt than you do manure. So it's inconsistent. Um, and then if you're spreading on fields that do have low or organic matter already, then compaction can, can be an issue, right? And so those are some of the cons that we talk about. I'm sorry I'm going really fast, but, but I, I do want to have some questions here from you guys. Um, wildlife conservation. Obviously, no soil disturbance will create extremely good nesting for our pheasants, um, and so that's a huge benefit to what we do. Um, the residue also creates great cover for the pheasants. Um, for those of you that have hunted pheasants, our upland game birds, they, they, need, ne they need nesting area and they also need um, cover for habitat. And then the, the other side for us too is wherever we plant these strips, it also makes for good grazing when we're done hunting, right? So, so it's kind of full circle. We don't just let the, the strips, you know, we, just, we actually maximize the strips after we're done hunting like this time of year, okay? So most operations can do one or two of those things that I mentioned on the acre. Most <laughs> operations are actually pretty good at doing one or two of those things. That we believe that if we do all three of those things on the acre, farm it like it needs to be farmed with soil health in mind, have the ability to graze that acre, right, at some point in time throughout the course of the year. And then the third, third thing was be able to to do some sort of egg retainment, hunt, hunt it in some fashion. If we do that, then we think we'll be viable for generations to come, okay? And so um, that is how our family looks at an acre of property, okay? That was really fast. <laughs> that was really fast, but I wanna open it to questions and, and um, discussion. So our family is extremely transparent um, just like Doug said earlier, uh, just because we do something, it doesn't mean that, you, that it's right, right? Um, it's like a shoe store, just how he explained. Uh, my shoe doesn't fit you, right? So with that, you guys, I'd like some discussion from the group. Uh, for your pheasant hunting operation, do you bring in any of the birds, or is it, uh, or is it all natural? Right. Uh, so we are... Uh, a preserve status, we have the preserve status, which means that we're regulated by the state of South Dakota to, to on, the, on our preserve acres, for every bird that we harvest, we have to replenish that bird, okay? And the reason we're a preserve status is because then we can start hunting on September 1st rather than the third week in October. So it allows us to, to capture more revenue earlier before the weather gets bad. And so that's, that's why we went. Now, we do have areas that we have maintained just for wild bird habitat, right? We don't put any birds out in certain areas. And so when we offer a three-day hunt, one of those days would be off the preserve if it's, if it's the normal season, and we'll go show them some, some wild bird hunting. Okay? So in those areas you have for the pheasants, do they, um, do, you, do you graze those too, or do you? Yes. Okay. Yep. Do you I'll, hay them as well, or? Well, I'll show you if I can get to this picture. The hunting was, is really good. This is a crick bottom here. And so we'll groom it. We'll, we'll hay around it so that so we can contain birds a little better. So we'll hay parts of it. And then this is, this is a food plot here. And then this is, this is crop ground. So we'll, we'll hay part of it just to kind of get the birds. We'll either hay it or graze it, one or the other, to get the birds kind of, you know, so we know where they're at. Do you grow cover crop for that you hunt, or do you have you tried any of that? Mo most of the cover crop that we that we plant is planted after um, winter wheat, so it's planted July August. 
and by October, hopefully, if it rains, then, then we will hunt it for sure. But a lot of times there's just not quite enough cover to actually hunt it. Now, the years that we've had excellent cover crop and good moisture, you can actually see, like when the turnips are, you know, a third of them sticking out of the ground, you can see where those birds are pecking on top of the turnip to get maybe some water or something. I mean, it's amazing what they'll do to those turnips. It's interesting. In operation the first uh, is yours, do you and overall, do you prioritize one area over another? You know, is it is it bulls first and, and then pheasants and then crop, or it, it, do you treat them all equally? So um, I would say that uh, to answer your question, yes and no. Um, obviously, the bulls are our widget, but the bulls can't eat without what we do on the cropping side. And honestly, with what Brian does on the cropping side, he needs to have cattle to integrate into that system to make it to get those soils where he wants them. And so um, there's probably not a priority, um, maybe from an economic standpoint, because the, the Angus bull is our widget, but we're always looking to try to lower the cost of that production of our widget and, and all these different things just to enhance soil health, right? Does that answer your question? Anybody else? There's gotta be more. What, <clears throat> what percent of the acres do you think you graze each year? Oh, goodness sakes. Um, it's not quite 100% because of uh, water and, you know, and infrastructure. Uh, but I would say it's probably at least 75 to 80%. And then follow up, do you end up hauling animals like to further away fields or is it mainly kind of closer to the operation? Most, most of the property is within a 20 mile radius of our headquarters. So a lot of times we will haul the cattle to the location to graze and then trail them back or you know stage them so you're not trailing them all the way in one day, stuff like that. Well, infrastructure is, is a challenge there, especially if you don't own the property, water and fencing. Um, we've, done, we've done a lot of work with the, the vents collars. I didn't put any slides on, on that, but um, we think that, that at some point in time, the virtual fencing will will help us uh, really enhance you know, what we want to do. Could you tell us a little bit more about that sure. process, how it works, and challenges? So have you guys, are you familiar with virtual fencing? You've seen the collars on the, you know, I think I do have a photo of one of them. Whoops, somewhere. Um, anyway, virtual fencing is, uh, you know, you have, a, you have a collar around an animal and you're, you're able to actually put a virtual fence anywhere. Um, and then control that animal's grazing uh, as much as you'd like. You can write prescriptions on the portal um, and then it will actually move that animal um, on, on a daily basis for you. Um, uh, and you know, I, I was talking to Pam about this earlier, but we, we um, probably wouldn't, it's not, it's not ready for industry yet. Um, I wouldn't recommend that everyone go out and buy into the virtual fencing system. The thing that they have to get figured out is retention. The, the collars, uh, well, in, in, in one of the companies that we used, there was 50% of the collars that either the battery died or they fell off. So that is the number one challenge right now. If we can figure out how to keep the collar on the animal, this, this will be a game changer for, for grazing cattle. Yep. What do you use to lock the collar on the animal? What do we use? To, yeah, to hold the collar on. It's like a chain. Gosh, hold on. I'll show you. You see that you see there's a chain. This is the this is a vents collar, and there's a chain that goes around there. And then there's, they have a, it's like a. I don't know, like a plastic, chain, hook that will actually, if it gets caught on something, it's got a 600 pound breakaway, because they don't want any of the animals to get hung up on something and then choke themselves out. So um, it's just really it's just, like zip ties and a cable that tie them together. Um, the hard part is sizing it, because they're up, you know, you know animals, it's just. Um, also, animals seem to find, like for example, we had an, a 500 acre pasture, and there was one post in the middle of the pasture. It was one post left over from, from two posts that had the old dust bag hanging from it. 
one of the posts was gone, but the other one was still there. And on that post, there was an old nail that was hanging out, just barely. And that heifer found that nail in that 500-acre pasture and hung her collar on it. It just happens. I mean, that's just the way it's going to go. I think the technology is going to be here, you guys, that this could revolutionize uh, or be a, a serious game changer for, for what, what we're doing anyway. Cody, uh, an operation this size, it's obviously more than just family members. Uh, talk about getting your staff to buy into your vision as yeah. far as soil health in, is concerned. Okay. Thank you. Yes, we have, uh, I think we have 50 people on payroll right now. And so um, every Monday morning we meet with our entire team uh, to talk about the week's business, right? We go through old business, we go through maintenance. And then after that meeting, we actually break out into our divisions, cattle ops, cropping, um, so on and so forth. So they have a really good understanding. We, we're really good at explaining, you know, why are we using the vents collars? You know, why are we doing this? They have to have buy-in. If, if, if my team isn't buying into what we're doing, then this whole thing will go down. It's, it's a failure. So it's, it's all about communication. We do annually also have strategic planning sessions with our people, and, and they have, you know, they have input. I mean, it's their, it's part of their, we will guide that session, but they have tons and tons of input, and when they have input, they have buy-in. And so that's, that's, how, that's how we do it. following suit? Uh, yeah, I, there's a ton of neighbors that are doing one of those three things, or two, perhaps, of the three things that I talked about. Um, of course, no-till has, has taken over, right, in our part of the world. You don't hardly see anybody, anybody tilling, maybe one operation that I can think of in Tripp County that is actually tilling their, their land. Um, so that, that part is easy. Um, as far as... Uh, you know, the collars, that's really new to, to people. Um, and then as far as integrating grazing and hunting and, um, you know, and then thinking about soil health, there's, I don't, there's not a ton of people that are really, you know, just the people is the hard part of all of that, having good people to help you manage all of that. And um, most of the neighbors are, are just, you know, family members and maybe a couple hired guys or something like that. So that, that's probably the, the constraint. Now, there's still operations that will turn their cows out on residue in the fall and then do a little bit of pheasant hunting, but the, to strategize around that whole thing, um, probably not as much. The pheasants are an introduced species to our South Dakota environment. Yep. And when we want to capitalize on the hunting of those and turn them out, they have an effect. Everything has unintended consequences. So if we turn out the pheasants, are you noticing any change in the population of the indigenous species? Is it benchmarked before, and as that uh, preserve status gets greater and greater, are you pushing some of the indigenous species aside, like the grouse or the partridge, the Ye quails? The yeah, so marks, the, um, the grouse have, have actually increased, I, I, I think. Um, and I don't, I don't know that it's as much about you know, I don't know if it has to do with us turning, turning uh, you know, pen-raised birds out into that environment that affects that. Um, what I think really affects uh, wild bird habitat, whether you're grouse or pheasant, is, is the hatch, right? We can talk about how tough winters are. We can talk about um, all the things that you do that could affect, um, the, you know, the population. But if, if, if our environment is rough during the hatch, for example, if it's a stretch of hot, dry, windy days when those birds are hatching. Those day-old chicks, before they can fly, don't have any dew on the leaves to, to drink, you know, to get their water source. They will just wither away, right? And, and it's all about the hatch. We can have a down year in wild birds, and then the next year, if we have a good hatch, you know, we're back to not normal, I would say, but we're, we're, we're gaining ground rapidly. So to me, it's all about the hatch. And being able to leave, you know, areas where, like that picture where that creek was, water pockets, where, where it's just tremendous nesting area for that. 
that part of the world, um, I would contend that there would be more wild birds than, you know, most places in the state of South Dakota. And it's all about water for those chicks. Yeah, I mean, it's the same, it's the same thing um, as everybody, you know, everyone doesn't, nobody likes coyotes. Um, I don't think coyotes are really our big problem. I think it's the, the birds of prey that are really a, a problem for us. Um, and I wouldn't even say that the eagle, the eagle's more of a scavenger, but owls and hawks, um, those are a problem, big problem for us. The other, the other problem that I think are, are pro, um, a big problem would be like nest eaters, you know, the raccoon, skunk, feral cats, things like that that eat the eggs. Um, so whenever the, you know, the, the government wanted us to go plant all these tree rows um, and, you know, cedar trees, and there's hundreds of hundreds of absentee landowners that would put these shelter bel belts in our part of the world. Well, that did nothing but create habitat for the birds of prey, raccoon, all the thing I'm talking about. Not only that, but now we're spreading cedar trees all over the country. So we kind of got to be careful what we think about there. That's just my opinion. Any other questions? How are we doing on time? Got about three minutes. So yeah. does anybody have any other? Jessica. So since you brought up woody species encroachment, do you have an issue with that on your operation? And if so, how do you deal with it? Like cedar trees? Yeah. Um, I, I wouldn't say it's an issue yet, but I can see it coming. Um, we've got hay ground that when I was a kid, you didn't see any cedar trees, and now there's just cedar trees popping up, even in crop ground, right? Um, so we try to take care of that, but, but I can see this being a real issue. I'm, I'm glad we're kind of trying to get ahead of it, but yeah, it, it can, it's, especially in our, in our native prairie systems. I don't like that at all. Just invasive weeds overall. Yeah, and... Right, I, I, I'm not as much worried about the invasive. We don't have a, a leafy spurge issue at all. I mean, we don't have, we do have some thistle, but uh, it's nothing. I mean, that has significantly reduced since we've implemented some intense rotational grazing. Um, that all those practices are that help, you know, help that. I'm not, I'm more worried about cedar trees, honestly. What, what are you looking at doing to help control your cedars? I don't know yet. I, other than mow them down, if they're about knee high and you can go in there with a mower, then I think you can, you, I don't see them coming back yet. If they're smaller than that, then they'll just, oops, they'll just bush, bush out and it's a problem. But there was, uh, where was it? Was it two weeks ago when we were out here? There was somebody talking about invasive, just cedar, tea, cedar trees in, in particular. Yeah. So I'm, I'm from Gregory, which is 30 miles east of you. Yep. Um, my grandpa said, like, on the Platte Winter Bridge, the cedar trees really took over them hills really bad. They did. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can look at year, uh, 50 years ago, there is no cedar trees on when that bridge was built or nothing. Right. So I think it's getting pretty tough. I agree. Yeah. Um, the, the other thing, too, is the co-op I worked at in Gregory, we actually found some, like, pill-like uh, chemicals that will kill them cedar trees pretty well. So okay. I don't know. That might be an option. Talk to him. Yeah, absolutely. Good. Well, thanks a lot, Cody. Um, hate to hold everybody from lunch, uh, but if you have questions, I think Cody will be around for a little while. Come find him. You so, bet. Thanks a lot. Thank you.